half of what I could observe because I have to keep coming back to, to be able to identify these asteroids. And, and this is inefficient, uh, and it, it felt wrong because ultimately this is an algorithmic problem. There, there should be enough information um, in one night, and then second night, and third night, and fourth night for me to, you know, if I had an infinitely powerful computer, I should be able to take all possible combinations of observations, for example, and only find those that fit Kepler in orbits, because those are, that's actually a fairly selective filter. It's just because I don't have a computer like that, or haven't really thought about the algorithms, I can't do that, and the solution is, well, let's make the telescope go reobserve uh, re -observe more often, which may be fine when you're building a project that, that's on order of 10 million, because algorithm development will cost you about a, a million or so, at least. But when you're building something at scales of, of half a billion, then it, it's worth investing into, into group algorithms. Yes, well, when fitting only compare in orbits, you will miss the space X uh, starting uh, satellites. Um, Unfortunately, we will not have to spend much time to see those. <laughs> so um, it's it's true. If um, if we have uh, something that is that is in highly non-Keplerian orbit, that that uh, say might be in geocentric orbit, uh, that those would not pick up. However, those will trail. So we have additional information on those because we, we see their trails, and then we can we can apply a different um, different algorithm to, to recover those. And there's, a, there's an interesting issue there because we're, we're explicitly actually staying away from low Earth orbit and, and, and doing those kinds of solutions because it's a potential national security issue. Um, we, we do not want to be publishing the catalog of all the satellites out there that... Um, there's also a problem that they may be coming in close to straight and you know, appear to be moving more slowly than they really are. Yeah, there are always these degenerate cases where things uh, that happens sometimes with near-Earth objects, where you have a trailing, and then you're, 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 you get it in an, an unhappy configuration where it's, where it's heading straight for you. Uh, but for those, the, the solution is um, just to extend the arc to observe before, observe later. And, and they're fairly, that doesn't happen very often, so that's, that's, that's fortunate. Um, so where I'm going with this is that I'm going to argue that we can do better than modify the telescope cadence. We can solve this uh, algorithmically. The answer to this is yes, um, and and most of the reason for the answer is actually due to, due to the person sitting right over there. Uh, so Matt and, and his crew developed uh, this algorithm uh, about three years ago uh, at the NPC, um, and the the idea is this. So one of the things, one of the problems, one of the challenges we're having when we're when we're linking uh, this is what's called the linking problem when we're trying to to link a, an asteroid detection that's been done in one night with another one uh, done three nights later and another one done three nights later is all we have here on the sky, if you look at them, is we have an instantaneous um, measurement of position velocity that we can potentially extrapolate forward, but that extrapolation is valid as long as this is, as long as it's, it continues to be linear or as long as the motion on the side is linear in the way this is traditionally done. And here's an example for, for one day, uh, for one uh, asteroid called Krako uh, over a 30 day arc. And you can see that it does a fairly complex shape on the sky. But the reason why it does it is because we're observing it from a moving platform. So this here is the sun, this here is the earth, and this here is an asteroid. So what we're seeing here is a combination of the earth's motion and the asteroid's motion. If you to transform this, this uh, your viewpoint into the center of the sun, what does this asteroid do? Well, this, the sun is at the center of its potential. It's a very high degree of accuracy. And what you see looking from the sun is you see this object moving on a great circle. So it's basically a straight line from the skies, from the sun's sky. And it, it turns out to look something like that. Now, the issue is for you to be able to do this transformation you need to know how far the asteroid is, and so you don't know that. These things don't have any eccentricity? Um, we'll, we'll get to that, but most of them don't, and it turns out that this, that, uh, this approximation is sufficient to detect them as potential candidates, and then you can compute the, uh, the eccentricity correctly and so forth. Uh, but the, the big challenge here is that you don't know the distance to, to the object. But what you can do is you can just assume the distance. 
And it turns out that a few, you can assume a distance at the, uh, uh, to, to the minor, uh, to the main belt. You can assume the distance to the Kepler belt. You can make a couple of assumptions at the distance of the distance and see which asteroids transform into these kinds of straight lines and pick them up that way. And this is basically, and I'm not, you know, I bet Matt could explain this better than I do. Uh, this is essentially the nutshell of the, of the heliolink algorithm. Assume a couple of distances transform to the, to the solar uh, centric frame, um, and then you have, you have straight lines that, that you can, uh, that you can dig out because all these objects, uh, actually each point you get a vector and you have a time. So you can just transform them to the reference time and they will all cluster in, uh, in one position. And so that's what's shown here. So I have the beginning, I have the transformed helio from the heliocentric frame, and then I propagate all these arrows to, uh, to reference time and I discover a cluster of, of arrows in the center, which uh, then I can dig out with a, with a clustering algorithm. And, and then these are, my, these are my asteroids. And does this work? The answer is yes. This is uh, uh, an application to, uh, to the isolated tracklet file that the Minor Planet Center maintains. These are asteroid observations accumulated over the years that haven't been uh, so far associated with any known objects. And you can see how you go from, from this in, in, uh, in, in Earth centered coordinates to uh, a groups of clusters that look much, much cleaner. And then you can actually um, dig, out, uh, dig out the asteroids from. Um, this technique, is there? I'm just wondering the last slide, the long lines were. Oh, these were these are some that are moving very fast. So the, the length of, of, of each line is uh, represents the, the velocity. Pretty disparate distribution. Yeah, Matt can comment more on, on kind of what's what these might be. The, the long strips are here of asteroids, right? So those things are close to us. What I'm saying is nothing in between, which is surprising. Uh, that's really six really long ones. So, so to move on here, uh, this is fantastic because uh, one of the things I didn't tell you, the, 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 the previous algorithms used to do these kinds of things scaled as, as n cubed, where n is the number of tracklets. Um, that means that if you make a mistake in your assumptions when you're building a telescope as to how many tracklets you're going to have, if you make a mistake by a fact, that's a factor of two, which oftentimes you do, because um, you can't estimate how well all pieces uh, of, of the machine are going to work then you need, you need eight times as many computers, um, which is unpleasant. Um, here the link scales is n log n, which is much better. Uh, and the constant factor in front of these is relatively small as well. So the, the conclusion here um, is that now we'll be able to replace a small cluster of, of machines uh, that we're playing for LSSD with almost a single machine that can handle LSSD scale workloads. And we're more robust against unanticipated differencing issues. So this is fantastic, and to me, this was like a wow moment. Where like, here's a demonstration of uh, an investment into into rethinking the algorithm, how you can actually improve significantly your performance of your existing telescopes. So this is what we're deploying on LSST. This is the current plan, and we put that uh, <coughs> we put that up on LSST. And what do we expect to find? Um, so this is the chart. If there's one thing I want you to remember from this uh, from this talk, it's it's, it's this chart. Or where to find it. Um, so these are the current numbers, currently known numbers uh, for, for all the various populations, and these are the expected LSSD discoveries. So we're going to go up by about between a factor of 8 and 40 for virtually every population in the solar system. Um, and this is going to happen not over the 10-year period of LSSD, but for most of these, actually over the first three years. So in the next five years, we're going to have most of, of this done. And then this opens up possibilities to do all kinds of studies uh, on, the, on the significantly large samples. Um, so I won't go through, through these um, one by one, but I wanted to, to put them up to, to show that there's, there's, already, there's already been a lot of thought into what, what can be done with this, and we have a, 
uh, solar system uh, science roadmap for the LSST that's on archive. The easiest way to find it is just Google LSST solar science, uh, solar system science roadmap. So for the inner solar system, example, we're going to get a um, factor of 10 more objects in the asteroid belt, but we're also going to get their colors, their shapes, their, um, and their, uh, their rotation um, information, so their, their periods. So that allows you to start playing games with uh, understanding the, the asteroid families, the structure of asteroid families, and understanding which asteroids might be primordial, which may not come from for any given family, and see how that constrains your, your planetary innovation models. Uh, similar things for Trojans, um, a number of other kind of ancillary things. If you're interested in occultations, uh, factor of 10 more objects to cult with. Um, in the outer solar system, I think personally it's even more exciting um, because the outer solar system is very sensitive to, uh, to two things. One, to what's even further in the outer solar system that you don't know about, like the, the uh, putative planet X and Y and Z. Um, and also to what's been happening to our in inner solar system over time. So if the planets were migrating, depending on how quickly the planets migrated, whether there was jumpy migration, whether it was smooth migration, you expect very different structures in the outer solar system. So all of this becomes possible to do because if you go back here, right now we know about 3,000 TNOs, and in about five years we'll know about 40,000. And I'll argue that we can actually lift that number up to something like 100,000 if you're even more clever with software. Um, here's an example for, for near-Earth objects. So near-Earth objects, uh, we're going to, to up the population to about 100,000. Right now it's, it's at levels of, of about 10,000 or so, 10 to 20,000. Many of these things are just a numbers game because it, they allow you to find objects